Hello and welcome to GitHub Universe. Uh, my name is Tim Drevencheck. I'm working for the Continental Corporation. And from my role, I'm a software architect or I'm a DevOps engineer. Um, and within this talk, I'd like to share with you the, world, or the work that we've done um, to switch from a mono-repository setup to a multi-repository setup. Yeah? Um, so this is the talk is, is about this topic. So um, the, the main question, if you, if you talk about mono or multi-repository setup, is how do you put your code into this one? So technically spoken, in Git, you have always some kind of two kinds of world how you store your data. Yeah? You can have on the left side, you could have a single repository setup or mono repository setup where you put simply everything into one large code base. Yeah? Um, and on the other side, you have a multi-repository setup where you have just some kind of linkage repository, so one main repository which is linking to your code, which is distributed over just a bunch of repositories. Yeah? Um, if, you, if you now say, OK, this setup, it's always some kind of to find the right solution for yourself. Yeah? Um, if you go for Google and search what is the right solution for me, you will get tons of different um, advantages, disadvantages on both behavior or on both setups. Um, so it's a bit, yeah, you need to find a way which one is dealing for you. So at our company or at our project, um, we started with the mono setup repository. And later on, we switched to a multi-repository setup because it was somehow required by, by uh, our code, how we build code, how we distribute software. Um, so we ended up in this, this multi-repository setup. And what I'd like to show you today is how we worked with this one because it's not so easy. And we brought out an, a tooling which is there for um, handling this in the background so that it feels the same way as would you like with a work with a single repository, the same way like you work with multi repository so, um, setups. And this tool we just open sourced a week ago. So on github.com you can download it, you can run it by yourself, and yeah, work with the same kind how we work uh, with multi repository setups. But yeah, let's get one step closer. Yeah? I mean, I'm here from Continental, so you might think, OK, it's a rubber company. What does a rubber company have to do with, with, with software and this kind of problem that I'm talking about? Um, so what you might know from Continental is mainly tires. Yeah? So tires, rubber, that is what you see in the commercials. That is what you might buy for your car. Um, but this is only the, the public available trend that is available um, to the world, or what, what people buy, or what people see in commercials and stuff like this. Um, so, but actually, we do more. Yeah? So I just tried to get an overview on what components we do and we manufacturing for the OEM market. And after, let's say, half an hour or so searching through their internal pages, I just stopped, yeah, because the page will not fit. Yeah? I think you can m multiply this page by five. Yeah? So from us, you can buy a high-pressure pump for a car. Yeah? You can get a 48-volt uh, generator. Yeah? You can get a system for braking system. You, we also do stuff like automated driving or uh, back-end services, which are connected to this kind of. So, to summarize it somehow, I would say Continental is, um, yeah, the only thing that we don't do is we don't bend metal around these components and call it a car, yeah? But at the rest, the whole components we built worldwide distributed. So the company itself is really spread around the world. We have around about quarter uh, million employees worldwide and at around about 500 locations. Yeah? So if you go for more numbers, we are the number two for Taya uh, Tier 1. So distributing or providing our devices to an OEM, which will build a car out of this one. Yeah? So at the end, I would bet that everybody of you has used our products while driving a car. Yeah? Um, so for me personally, I mean, while the company does everything somehow, um, I'm located, I'm from Germany. Um, so in the middle of Europe, and I'm working uh, R&D. Um, geographically, I'm located at really at the center of Germany, so around Frankfurt. Um, there are two locations. One is um, Babenhausen, one is Wetzlar. 
I never heard maybe this uh, this uh, cities before. So Wetzlar is mainly in infotainment. So we do the classical way of radios, infotainment. We do also navigation system. Yeah. So technically spoken, what we're dealing with in the software perspective is we're dealing with Linux, we're dealing with Android systems that we build up upon radios and navigation system. And on the other side, the second location I'm pendling around or I'm doing work travel to is Barbenhausen, which is making cluster instruments. Yeah? So cluster instruments is somewhere we try to prevent that you run into a speed trap with these devices. And inside these devices, we deal mostly with real-time operating system. We deal with safety aspects that you need to pack into this product until it hits the market. But we do also more stuff like head-up displays, interior camera system, detecting how you behave and how you feel and drive the car itself. So back to my work. Um, I'm currently working in, in a project where we really migrate both systems to become one. Yeah? So if you have a look at the past, you will see that um, a speedometer was before, or a cluster instrument was before, just the mechanical stuff which was showing how fast you drive. Yeah? Then the current way, it's more like um, you have a mixture out of a full display system and uh, something where some parts are still mechanically. Uh, on the other side, the multimedia part was you, you have your navigation system on a CD, put it in, plug it in, and then you have your navigation system. Today, these systems are mostly uh, bound to cloud environments. And my work is that we migrate both systems into one product. Yeah? Um, so we get, in the future, we will see more and more cars driving with a single SOC. So both devices are migrated into one device, into one central processing unit. And this brings some kind of complexity into the system because now you have a system which is some kind of mixed safety. So you have from the multimedia, it might crash, but the speedometer should not crash. Yeah? So you have a mixed safety, you have open source, uh, open partitions where you can really get code, a website, and so on. So the website should not be able to crash your cluster system. So we have a mixed safety system where we have virtualization, different OSs running on a single SOC. Um, so this is some kind of the pre-story. Uh, and now the question is, where does this take um, with the multi-repository setup? So back to the introduction of my talk, um, what is the issue because which we ran into yeah, the requirement to switch from a single to a multi-repository setup? And that is somehow yeah, that we have a real wide, uh, or a wide spectrum of product variances. So, and this somehow brings us uh, that we also have this interface problem. Yeah? And what we'd like to do on the other side is we'd like to have a distributed atomic operation on our code. So when we make changes to our software for our, pro for our devices, we would like to have this as an atomic operation. So let's give a small example. Let's say you buy a new car. What you do is you go to a website or to a dealer, and then you start defining what kind of car you would like to have. And so you start with the engine, then next, you take the color of the car. And the third part might be, what features should, should your car include? And there might be that you add, for example, a parking system or um, parking distance, park distance control. That might be that you enrich the infotainment capacity of your car. That might be that you add drive assistance system to your car and or a rear view camera. So it's in this website configuration, you click what you like to have, send it up, and some weeks, some month ago, you got a new car from your brand that you like. But this kind brings us, so as a, as a tier one manufacturing of device, into some kind of problematic, how we need to deal with software inside this product. Um, so you cannot simply say, okay, I will take a speedometer and put in the largest chip to, put, to, to get everything done. Yeah? So we cannot say, OK, we have a chip that can re, um, run rear view camera, infotainment system, assisted driving into a, a budget car. Yeah? So you simply cannot put a chip in, which costs maybe $50, $100 or something like this, um, into a system where you don't have so much um, where, where the OEM cannot sell uh, for, for, a, for a budget car. 
so this kind of configuration somehow leads that we have a combinatorial problem in our software when we're manufacturing these devices. So, for example, um, you have a, an algorithm that is calculating the fuel state of a, of a car. Yeah? So the input parameters will depend on what car you buy, if it's uh, on, the, on, the wheel stay, on the wheelbase. So if you have a long or a short car, the tank, the fuel tank will differ. So the algorithm will differ also that you have inside the cluster instrument. The second might be if you've chosen a feature, for example, a rear view camera, this will depend that you will require a different chip because not all chips, I mean, when you just have a speedometer which is showing the speed and the total kilometers, you might not have a video in system or a video in processor to get in data from a rear view camera into this one. So at the end, and uh, one thing that I missed is um, that we are in, in the embedded market. So yeah, we deal with chips which have sometimes below one megabyte of size also, yeah? up to systems which have two gigabyte of size for memory or for flash footprints. Um, so therefore, to summarize it how, somehow, yeah, the requirement is that we need to have a component-based model also in the embedded world, where we don't have 100 layers of interface. We're not in the Java world. Yeah? I mean, people were doing assembly some years ago, and now we're back to hardcore C++ programming. Yeah? Um, so our main problem, or our requirement, is that we are in a, in, in a way that we can reuse our code around different projects or within a, um, a different line of products that we're generating. So if you say, OK, back to the, to the main topic, mono or multi-repository, if you go for mono repository, that is easy to handle for everybody. Yeah? So you have just one repository, you check it out, and you have everything on your hard drive. It always con uh, contains a, a consistent state. So that, yeah, when you have one checked out, everything will be in there. But the issue with this setup is you cannot make some kind of components. You cannot really make component reuse. You cannot reuse one component within another project. You cannot share code. And this is maybe not the right solution if you really deal with, with the large code bases. Um, and also, one issue, when you have embedded code, you have really strong dependent code. You have no interface layers in between. And on the second side, you have this multi-repository setup. Therefore, the problem with the component decoupling is solved. Yeah? One component may contain, the, or one repository may contain the graphics subsystem. One other may contain the flash routines. Some contain the fuel uh, algorithm that calculates the fuel. Um, so this one is really there for splitting up your code or a large code base into multiple components. But someday you will run into the problem that this one is not so easy to handle for the developer itself. So because you don't have a unique state over these repositories. Yeah? You check out the stuff, you have different baselines. Yeah? So you don't have one master repository, one master line. You have 10, 20, 30 different main lines that you need to somehow harmonize. There are some approaches available, how to connect them. So one is, for example, submodules or Google Repo, which will provide you this kind of linkage system, saying, OK, this repository needs to be linked together. So submodules or Google Repo is the uh, tools that you might choose. And while the multi-repository setup is somehow strange to handle, there is also something like subtree or Yocto combo layer, which will provide you a way that you have this multiple repository set up, and they simply merge it down to one large repository that you can exchange and share across. But that is not somehow the, the right solution they would like to have. Uh, for example, what you also have inside these um, multi-repository setups is the interface change problem. Let's say today you would you have your, your setup with 20 different repositories, and you'd like to make a change, saying switching from Python 2 to Python 3. And so what will happen is you will nearly need to touch every line of code that you have inside your repositories. Yeah? And now, how do you deliver this as once? Yeah? I mean, you can deliver each repository each by its own, but in between this delivery, there might be one time where you have an inconsistent state inside your, your repository setup. 
And I'd like to show you this one. So um, sub-repositories is supported in GitHub. Um, so what you see on the upper left is that you have the super repository, which is um, really some kind of connecting the other repositories. So um, you have two folders which are pointing or referencing to some other repositories. So the super repository is referencing the documentation and the source repository. So what I'd like to show you is how this is working. So how you deal with this kind of stuff. Yeah? So first of all, what you do is you put in a git module file into your super repository. And inside this git modules, you define which folder should be referenced by which repository setup. So here, the doc folder will be referenced by a test mega merge doc.git repository. And the source folder will be referenced by a different sub module, uh, sub repository. Um, Git will store this kind of linkage here, and the SSH1 key that is actually referencing inside this tree of the sub-repository um, will be stored in the Git tree object itself. So we won't see this here, you will only see this while, uh, while committing stuff. So how to work with this kind of stuff is you go here and say, okay, I would like to add a readme file. So you go in the super-repository describing this is my super-repository. The same you can also do for the sub-repositories. So you go to the sub-repositories, add their file, saying, OK, this is my documentation repository. And yeah, and the third one is, for example, inside the source repository saying, OK, this is my source repository. And the interesting part, many of the UI tools support this kind of workflow, because later on, I can say, OK, I would like to commit this stuff. So here, you don't do one commit, you do three commits, one for the source, one for the doc, and one for the main repository, the super repository. And here what you see is it's not only the readme that was added, it is also the reference onto doc and source repositories is adding. So the SSH1 referencing the other repositories will be added also. So then I can push the stuff and everything is on master. Works, so why I'm staying here and telling you something about this one. What is missing completely is the Git workflow somehow. And the tricky part here is, while we're referencing an SSH1 key out of the sub-repository, and we have in the Git world, in the GitHub world, we have this, um, this pull request workflow. They don't fit together. So if you have on the upper right, you have the super-repository, which is referencing to a sub-repository by pointing in SSH1. So I say, from the source repository, I want to check out on the equation SRC, SRC um, the following content. When I push this now to a GitHub server, what is happening, the input and the output of a pull request will differ. So whatever comes in is not the same as what is coming out. So the main issue with this one is that first, while the pull request is open, the main line might change. And the second one is the configuration, how the merge will behave is not really clear while you're opening the pull request. So you could say the pull request should be closed while doing a merge. It should be closed while doing a rebase. Or it should be closed by doing a squash. Squash every commits inside this pull request down to one. So bringing changes to the main line will change the SSH1 key that we would like to reference from another, from the super repository. And there is somehow our dilemma that we need to solve here. And we did this by providing an external solution, what we call mega merge, somehow because we do multiple merges automated at the same time. So our tooling is nothing more or less than a GitHub application, which is instrumenting the main of, or which is instrumenting the organization, the pull request on the GitHub server. So what we did is um, we written an application based on Ruby on Rails. Um, we used the OctoKit uh, framework for this one. We packed it into a Docker, and we throw it on, on a Kubernetes cluster to run. So what we do on the, on the one side is um, we can create the look and feel and the behavior from the GitHub perspective as you were dealing with just one repository, with a single repository. but while you can do changes which are distributed over multiple repositories. 
And the, the interesting part here is when you see this little Jenkins icon over there, the CI does not need to know about anything that is happening inside. So there is no additional external script magic that you need to add to, to check out the code that we have inside this construct. We are only using Git submodule with a native operation on Git. And we only use the GitHub API and the GitHub methods that are available. The only thing that we do is we actually script it and yeah, modify the stuff from the outside world. So our application will work on API calls. So we are instrumenting the GitHub through the API calls. And when you say, OK, I would like to create this kind of linked pull request or connected pull request, we will not create one pull request. We will create multiple pull requests and link them internally together. On the same side, we're using webhooks. So whenever something is happening inside this GitHub for, with our connected pull request, we will affect or we will trigger actions that needs to be done. For example, updating one linkage between different sub-repositories. And yeah, last but not least, um, one thing that is while we use this API, we don't need to check out your code on, on the server. So there is no requirement that this mega merge tool will need to check out the whole repository, which might be large, I don't know, 50 gigabytes or larger. So we don't need to do this. Everything is done on the GitHub server. And we are only calling different REST API calls on this one. So for the outside world, if you're a CI system or a developer, we have the same kind of methodology. We have the same kind of use and feel like you are dealing with a mono repository. So if you see um, on the upper left, you will see the main line is still there. Or for a mono repository, you have the main line. And what you also have is a Jenkins that is building uh, a pull request. So GitHub provides this kind of pull request branch. Um, while you create a pull request, you might do your changes. And then what the server will do, it will generate you some kind of hidden branch, which is a pull request branch, which will contain the actually merge of both of the main line and your feature branch down to one pull request branch. And this method methodology we are using in uh, multi-repositories set up the same kind or this in the same way. So here also the developer will see version one and version two on the main line. And the Jenkins that is building this stuff will get the pull request branches in between. So while they didn't hit the main line, you will still see what is going on. So you don't need any additional changes in your CI infrastructure. You can just pull on the pull request branch of the super repository. And what you will get is you will get references to the sub repository, which are also inside the pull request state. OK. I'd like to show you three parts um, how this is done. So first should be covered how to make commits, how to create a pull request, and the third one, how to merge the stuff. Because this somehow a bit differs. Um, so the first step is, let's say you have a change which is now distributed over three repositories. So one change is in a super repository, and the other two changes are in a sub repository, so, so under source and under doc. Um, let's see how this looks when, when it's connected. Um, the first of all, I start with a Jenkins file. So in my super repository, I will create a Jenkins file, which is there for CI automatization for us. So have this really easy and uh, or very, very simple one. You have a pipeline with a single step. And in this step, I'm referencing now a run script, which is not part of the super repository but which is part of a sub-repository. So I'm dialing into a CD SRV and then call a run script. So this run script itself, which will be generated now, make it executable, and will do also a simple operation, will simply cut out the output, but not from its own repository, but from the docked repository. Yeah, so what we're doing now is we are linking three repositories together, super repository, source repository, and documentation repository. So what will happen is this should be outputted. And to make this happen, what you do is create a branch for every repository. 
not on the master, you don't push on master, we simply push on the universe branch for this example. You could also do this with forks. So our method works for forks in the same way as it works for, for um, adding branches. Yeah? So you create these branches, you commit your stuff to these branches, and you push it to the server. So what you will have now in the first step is simply something that is disconnected. So you have three changes on three branches somewhere on the GitHub server. Pushing stuff. So the next step is now how you connect these stuff. How to make a pull request, yeah? I mean, the usual way is you push your stuff onto one branch, push it to the GitHub server, saying create a pull request. This one is now done with a different tooling. So you don't create a pull request in our example with a GitHub interface. You create a pull request with a mega merge tooling. So you go to this website and say, OK, I would like to create a pull request with include the following three changes and build me something as a unique, as an atomic operation. So what the tool will do in the background, it will create you three different pull requests. So it first will create a pull request on the source repository. Second, it will create a pull request on the document repository, which might also include um, code uh, review. So to make a review until your feature branch hit the main line. Yeah? So it will create a pull request on the source and doc in the first step. And then it will link the pull request branch to the master, to the super repository. Yeah? So we are not referencing something that was there before. So inside this super repository, inside the submodule configuration, we will enter the SSH1 key, which is the temporary output of the pull request. So this solution is then kept temporary. So it is inside the system, super repository pull request referencing a pull request from a different sub-repository. And the advantage of this feature is that whenever I have a CI system pulling on this pull request and trying to build this one, it's just worked, yeah? It's the same way as you have a single repository. It will say, behave the same way, yeah? So it will check out this temporary branch, and it will build this stuff. So back to a video, how this look. Um, this is the application that we have. We run it on a, on a, on a server. So the user will connect to this one, um, go through this. I am a GitHub application. I would like to authorize stuff. Next step is I can see the organization. We didn't use it here, but you can select now the super repository. So you're selecting the main repository where the super repository where everything is connected to, select the branch, so here the universe branch. And the next step is you connect the sub repositories to this super repository merge. It's simply by selecting these sub repositories, saying, OK, which branch are my changes on, and where do we would like to change this on? So for universe to master. And then the moment I hit the save and update, the system will go there, contact the GitHub server, and say, ah, please do the following for me, create the sub-repository merges, update the SSH1 in the main repository, and we're done. And what happened now is that a CI system that was included here will do what it should do. It will build the stuff, and it will output. Yeah? So here, the Jenkins file, go to SRC, call the run script, and dumps out our graphics. So far, it's so good. But what happens now if you change your code, if you like to modify different stuff? Yeah? If you're in the pull request, what might happen is always like you push something and I say, ah, it didn't work this way. I need to modify my stuff. I need to change what I have inside the repositories. I, me I need to make a patch for this one. Um, so here we are back, and this is still working the same way as before. So you simply go to the doc repository and create a patch. So you push a patch onto the doc repository, modify something, and what will happen is the pull request will be updated. And in the moment that you update, or in the moment that the server will update the pull request, we will catch this event. So we don't actually listen only for push and pull request changes. We listen to all kinds of events. So whenever there is an update, the mega merge will wait for this one. 
see, okay, this repository is linked to the following super repository, and it will enter the newly generated SSH1 key into the super repository referencing this one. And then, yeah, Jenkins will go and build the stuff. The same example here, yeah, you have the original documentation file. You say, okay, I add here a horse, so, and I would like to ch push this change. So I'm pushing this change only to the doc repository, so only the doc will be updated. Push it to the server, and just a second later, or 10 seconds later, what will happen is that the mega merge will update the referencing of the super repository now to your new change, and there is a change. It's back on the, on the pull request, or on this connected pull request. And now, back to the last of the three parts. So we have committed something, we have created a pull request, we made a change on this pull request, and now the last step is really to how to bring this change to the main line. And therefore, we also, that is an internal way of how to deal with this one, is we react on updates, on any update. So for example, um, we react on the state saying, is this pull request mergeable or not? And we say, when there, ever, when there is any, any, any change pending, so not in the super repository, but in, is there a, a code review pending on one of the sub repositories? We will listen to the events coming from this repository, and whenever there is a uh, review done, it could be merged. We will update the super repository, or we will just wait until everything is done. So when I have the first um, feature branch, which is okay, review done, nothing might change. But when I touch the second um, sub repository, then my state some gets somehow gets reviewed. So whatever I have as preventing us from merging this atomic change set to the main line is now done. Everything is green. Yeah? So code review was done on the one sub-repository. Code re review was done on the second um, sub-repository. So in this moment, what we do, the automatism will start merging the sub-repositories down to the main line. So this is actually the first time that any change of you, which you have pushed to pull request, will actually hit the main line and be publicly available. And on the second or in the same time frame, while we first start merging the sub-repository content to the main line, we will do the same again. We will update our super-repository here, enter now the final SSH1 key. So whatever might be there, it might be squashed, might be merged, might be rebased, the output of the final commits will now be um, integrated in the sub module configuration of the super repository. And the last step is merge the main line or merge the pull requests of the super repository down to the main line of the super repository. And that is the point where we really have done this op atomic operation and delivered out to other people. <laughs> OK. Um, giving back to a video how this look. So I can, what we do is we, we have some kind of linkage inside the description that we are automatically generating. So for the sub-repositories, I say, okay, simply approve, everything is fine, documentation is fine, and also the source code looks fine for me, so approve it. And what will now is the moment that the system, you see, merge. Yeah? So it will automatically start merging the stuff and bring it to the main line. So at the end, what we have Super repositories merge, referencing the output of the sub repositories, and we have a consistent state that was delivered. So at this moment, really, it is that you can switch now the reference from 1.0 to 2.0. Yeah? So there is no, 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 no time that we ever touched the mainline or the baseline in between this. So while you start this operation and you end this operation, there is nothing that hits really the mainline that might corrupt because one interface change might be different or, or depending on other sub-repositories. And the output is quite simple. Yeah? At the end, we are somewhere back at the, the start of my talk. Yeah? We are in one super-repository super referencing two sub-repositories itself. So, as a conclusion, 
we have created a tooling that extend the GitHub pull request but for handling multi super uh, for handling sub repositories sub modules. Um, this solution acts as an add-on. Um, it only requires Git and GitHub features, so no additional checkout behavior, script, whatever comes after the pull request to merge this in between and also to merge this final state. Um, we don't need any additional database, yeah? so we don't need anything stored in a MySQL or so. We store everything inside the GitHub pull request description somehow. Yeah? You can put their hidden marks so everything stays inside this configuration. And for us, we see this as a proof of concept because it was the first time that we were able to make use of the pull request mechanism that is inside GitHub and also make use of the Git modules or Git configuration, the Git core itself, without touching any additional stuff. Um, so from, uh, from our perspective, hopefully something will come in GitHub somewhere in the future. And therefore, yeah, we open source this stuff under Apache 2 license. Um, you can go there, you can check it out, you can fork it, and you could also yeah, provide us some pull requests for this one. Thank you very much.